In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. So yesterday, we got to rehearse the baptism. So I got to practice with Belle and with Jacori, and we practiced the baptism together that we're going to do this morning. And Belle was very active running around, and she found the two dragons that are hidden in our stained glass windows. If you all haven't found them, I urge you to look. And this little man, well, his mom held his hands, and he just danced in the pew. Watch him. He's a happy boy. He loves to dance. Many of you know my story, but my very first memory of church was when my mom, who's a concert pianist, was rehearsing the organ, and she had only turned the lights on in the chancel. And this was a big, old church in New Haven, Connecticut, with the high ceilings, just like this cathedral, marble floors. So I got to come in. It was evening, and I took off my shoes, and I ran, and I slid down the aisles in my socks. And I played in the pews. And I think I was about four years old, but I remember sensing the presence of something huge, something full of love that was in this beautiful place, something that was playing with me, though I couldn't put it into words. And growing up, my dad was often so depressed, he would go to bed for the longest was, I think, three months at a time. And so our house was, was, you know, we were always worried. But when I came to church, there was this sense of peacefulness and stability and love. The people there, they always were happy to see me. Even when I was a teenager and I missed months at a time, they would still be happy to see me. I couldn't put it into words then, but I sensed God's presence in the people, in the beauty of the space, and in the worship. And even to this day, after 20 years of being a priest, and God knows how many vestry meetings, I still walk into this beautiful space and I, my blood pressure goes down. You'd think it would go up. <laughs> a few nights ago, I was watching Netflix, just perusing. You know how there's this new thing on Netflix where you can kind of see what a film is about and it gives you a little trailer, and then you can move on to the next one. You can sort of surf movies. It's kind of cool. I was going through all these romantic movies, you know, they hate each other, but they gradually learn to appreciate her, each other. Or the woman, her husband dies tragically in a plane accident, and he comes back as a ghost and inspires the next guy who becomes her husband. Or these two people fall in love, but they don't know how to make it work, and they finally do. And on and on, all these movies about relationships, as if the goal in our lives, and I think most of us, some part of us believes this, the goal in our lives is to find the perfect relationship with another person, someone who's going to adore us all the time, think we're perfect, and we will be perfect because they think we're perfect, and we'll live together happily ever after. Well, how many people have really found that? So we search, and we try, and we date, and we marry, and we try again, and we try to make friends, and we realize with every human relationship that we have that there's always something off, always something broken. 
We can off, sometimes we can work through it or accept it, but it's never this perfect, perfect, perfect love, love, love that we long for and yearn for. And we see other couples in the coffee shop and say, they've got it, they've got it. They are so in love. Well, just go home with them for a while. <laughs> we don't realize that in searching for the per perfect relationship with another person, we're looking in the wrong place. We've already been given the perfect relationship. It happened on the day that you were baptized. On the day that you were baptized, the greatest love in all the universe held out his, her hand and said, I'm yours and you're mine. I invite you to love me. I invite you to dance with me. I will love you perfectly because I made you. I will die for you and rise again. I adore you. And there's nothing that you can do to change that. You can run away and I'll let you run, but I will always have my hand outstretched to you, inviting you to the dance. Today is called Trinity Sunday. You see, across the world, Christians dedicate one Sunday to this concept of God called the Trinity. Because we can't understand God. So for thousands of years, theologians have tried, and they've gone deep into the Gospels and noticed that Jesus sometimes said, go out and preach to the nations and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Why did Jesus call God by three names? What was he trying to tell us? What does that mean? For one thing, it means that God is relationship. God already has all love within the divine self. God doesn't come to you because God needs your company. God is already dancing and loving within God's very self. We were created not because God was lonely, but because God was just joyful and playing. And three in one and one in three makes absolutely no sense at all, right? Which is exactly right. Because we cannot understand God. So don't try to make sense of the Trinity. Let it not make sense. You're never in this life going to intellectually and rationally comprehend God. Not in God's entirety. If you try to do that, you'll create an idol. You'll limit God. So let God be mysterious. Let God be that presence that you feel and know that is there, but that you can't fully understand that one to whom I have so many questions, like why do people fall sick and die, and why, are there, why is there suffering, and why are there hurricanes and wars? Believe me, when I get up to heaven, I'm going to have a lot of questions. But I trust that by the time I get there, I may have the capacity to understand the answers, whereas now I do not. Now I can only trust and take that hand that is outstretched to me and learn to dance. So how do we describe the Trinity? Well, we can't describe it in its entirety, but sometimes we come across things that point to it. A couple of years ago, I was reading a book about Joe Rance who was a lonely young man. His 
family had sort of disowned him, even though he was a good young man. It was the Great Depression. And he went to the University of Washington and joined the crew team because he wanted to find a place where he belonged. Joe's crew team of eight young men became so good that they went to the Olympics in 1936 in Berlin. No one expected that they would beat the British or Nazi Germany, but Joe would later write that occasionally when they were rowing, something extraordinary happened to them that was beyond words. Joe decided he was going to call it getting in the swing. He said after all their hard work and after all their exercise and endless, endless hours of rowing, sometimes in the middle of a race under great pressure when their muscles were just aching and dying, something would happen and the eight of them would become one. And for some brief moments, they would row together with such strength. And it was as if he said he was touching heaven. As an old man, Joe would recall that moment of swing as if it was yesterday because he felt known, loved, and part of something much greater than himself. In your baptism, you have been invited to become part of God's work in this world, part of a dance of joy that has no relationship with what goes on in this world. You are called to love no matter how bad your life gets. No matter how many conflicting relationships you have or illnesses, you are called to be joyful because you've already been known and loved eternally by the only one who is truly capable of loving you well. You are God's children, the baptized ones, You've already been invited.